All right, so welcome everyone to today's installment of the CCE 2022 Spring Seminar Series on Community Engaged Research in the Cultural and Evolutionary Sciences. Um, so just a heads up, our next talk will be in two weeks time on April 20th, when we'll hear from CCE graduate student Tavis King and his collaborator, Dr. Hannah Madden, um, who's at Liverpool Hope University. And they'll talk to us about how to do inclusive quantitative research with the LGBTQ community. Um, so today I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Cameron Brick, who's assistant professor of social psychology in the Psychology Research Institute at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, Cameron's work addresses pressing issues in environmental psychology, including collective action problems and the public communication of policy, uh, and utilizes forward thinking open science research pipelines. And his work has earned him both the 2021 APS Rising Star Award, as well as the 2022 Early Career Achievement Award from the Environmental Psychology Division of the APA. And today we'll be hearing about Cameron's wide ranging research on measuring and predicting individual environmental impact. Um, and Cameron has said that he welcomes questions during the talk. So feel free to unmute or put some questions in the chat and I'll try to moderate those. Uh, well, thank you, Cameron. Please take it away. That's very kind. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm going to just throw the talk slides in the chat. So if you are someone who prefers to take your own speed, there they are. Yes. So the exciting thing for me about this research area has been how relevant my training was in social psych to, uh, to a bunch of current things that are going on in the world, um, you know, the sustainability development goals, but here's the new IPCC report just out uh, in April, um, including more social science than it ever has before. Um, so I think there's an increasing recognition that even if we had the right solar panel technology, we still need uh, all kinds of um, understanding of human behavior from anthropology to economics to psychology as well. So one of my favorite papers uh, in this space lately is by Christian Nielsen, who's currently a postdoc in Cambridge. And he talks about how people of high SES influence greenhouse gas emissions through multiple types of roles in society. And I think if you were to look at the literature of en environmental psych, you would see a lot of focus on consumer. Like uh, if we change the way that products are labeled in the supermarket, do people have different willingness to pay or different intentions, that sort of thing? Or who, like what demographics and psych uh, predictors predict uh, people making different flying decisions. Okay, those are all good research questions, but there's definitely an over-reliance here. There's a lot of other roles we have. And lately I'm thinking more about um, our the meso level, the organizational level. So like your talk series could have brought me out in person. And like from Amsterdam, that's easy. I take the train, but you know, maybe if I was flying there, then you have to think about whether that's an appropriate department policy. Those kinds of choices are going to end up being bigger overall than whether at home you choose to go from 60% recycling to 70% or something. Like I'm less interested in those changes uh, because they're less visible and because they don't have enough, uh, enough overall effect on emissions. Some people will wonder whether it's appropriate for us to um, engage so much with social questions when we're um, when science has a goal to remain objective. I think the goal is good, but science is never value free. I guess it may be in anthropology. This is more obvious to you because you bring in such a massive set of assumptions from yeah, host culture. But um, we're never completely objective in the research questions that we take on what we consider worthwhile and the methods we use to address them in what kinds of populations. And uh, from my experience talking to the public about environmental issues, they don't just want me to write papers. They also expect me to talk to them, to express what we're finding in language they understand in contexts where they are, not waiting for them to come to us. So me personally, I believe in a balance that's responsive to current events. And like, although there are many important research areas, climate change this decade is a particular emergency worth more attention. So that has shaped some of my um, research program. 
it's not just social psychology among the social sciences. I'm seeing engagement from a surprising range of fields. In this, this paper was uh, in a neuroscience journal about neuroscientists. You know, I think, okay, that's not obvious, the connection to the climate emergency. But I just point out that they think there is a way for them to serve through their professional societies, through their um, departments, and also even in terms of the um, um, research questions they select, which we can chat about. But the main point here would be, how do we reduce institutional flying? Uh, it's, it's a pretty low hanging fruit for the amount of greenhouse gases it represents uh, for university. If you could think about a university across all of its activities. But it's not just um, in terms of advocacy and organizational change. I think there's actually quite a lot more links to sustainability across different areas of psychology than is commonly recognized. I'm not going to read these out, but I'll just be quiet for 10 seconds to look at maybe whichever area interests you the most. Cameron, can you just say what CSR is under industrial? Yeah, that's, that's corporate social responsibility, which is this sort of term within business, let's say, for them trying to do good. It's also been referred to as the triple bottom line, like um, trying to be ethical and uh, environmentally thoughtful in addition to profits shaping decisions. Yeah. I've also sent in the chat there that OSF link, uh, Janet Swim kindly um, compiled a bunch of resources about different areas of psychology working on climate stuff and many of them not in social like in clinical and such so that was that was welcome to hear about if i were getting started um will and i were chatting about this earlier like in a new research area i probably would begin by looking at uh, a pre-existing data and the and there is a ton actually including on environmental topics um I'll throw these in the chat too. Uh, th this is all freely available and it existed before I compiled it, but the, the only thing that I did was just try and put it in a spreadsheet that was openly editable and easy to access, like as opposed to needing to go through some sort of search function. You can just look through the, the metadata and see which of these might be relevant. Go test some hypotheses or encourage your students to explore. I also use these in classroom um activities like uh, competitive p hacking is a really fun classroom assignment and you can have giant samples here to do that sort of thing so me as a social psychologist i study large-scale social issues like climate change and i'm interested in how people decide to do things and whether their story about their decisions is the thing that's causing their behaviors or how much it's more you know, things that are less visible to them, like social norms. And I'm especially interested in how we recognize that we should do something about climate change, but we're just not doing it fast enough. I have some other research areas, but the main focus of my work is on what is predicting pro-environmental behavior. And I started this work on the left, looking at personality differences, and then moved into some more proximate things like attitudes or identity. Um, and we do have some evidence, by the way, for that causal direction claimed here. Um, and then I studied social visibility, which is up top. And that's about whether people change what they're doing when you watch them. And it turns out that people may do more pro-environmental behaviors if you watch them, depending on their identity. But you can also find people who don't want to be seen as environmentalists, who, when you watch them, will start doing less of those behaviors. And lately, I'm, I'm just looking at what even is pro-environmental behavior, and that's kind of what I'll talk about today. But, um, but first, uh, when I was living in the UK, which was uh, 2017 to 2020, there was, it did feel like there was a tipping point, like something was really shifting about uh, public perception and engagement with climate change. And I was, I was surprised in particular by how many people were getting arrested at these nonviolent protests. Traditionally, I mean, I don't know about the current setup with the UK policing bill and such, but 
Traditionally, getting arrested at these uh, kinds of protests is pretty difficult. They don't want to arrest you. It's a lot of paperwork. You'll get 10 or 15 hardcore activists getting arrested because they uh, are sitting in an intersection blocking it and the police say, would you please move? And they say no. But for a thousand people to get arrested, it, it means there is really a groundswell of engagement and people agreeing to get arrested who have never done that sort of thing before. So that felt to me like something really might be shifting. And then COVID came and the outside demonstrations have uh, been cut short, but the organization continues. And um, it does seem like uh, environmental concern has actually remained quite high in the UK, even across the pandemic. We did some research about how people reacted to those large scale protests in London, shutting down roads and making things more difficult for thousands of London commuters. And we looked at a representative sample of the UK for before, during, and after a big protest. And what you'll see is that, um, yeah, broadly speaking, there's more people strongly opposing these actions than strongly supporting them. And that it makes sense. What I was surprised by was that afterwards, the, there's a substantial increase in strongly support. Because this is a representative sample, we can begin to generalize that this might be 2 million more Brits uh, supported those actions afterwards than before. That's a, that's a lot. And this is especially surprising because the most widely read dailies like um, Daily Mail, The Sun, whatever, covered the protests uh, quite negatively. This also taps into some work we've done with segmentation. I don't know if anyone's done any um, latent class analysis or k-means clustering. These are just words for a kind of a segmentation technique where you take a bunch of variables and you try and ask which people are more similar to each other. So instead of asking which items are more similar to each other, like in a factor analysis, you take a bunch of items and you ask which of these people are most similar in this multidimensional space. And uh, we found that there are four groups that are, this, this uh, model fits best across uh, however many countries this was, 22 countries plus Israel, I think, in Europe. Um, and yes, and that they're, the largest group is people who are indifferent. If you think about engaged on the left, this is people who say that uh, climate change is real and it's human caused and I have a personal responsibility to do something about it and we can do something. Like it's someone who has high in all the kinds of questions you might imagine being related to this. Pessimistic is high on all those things except for efficacy. So they do believe that uh, climate change is happening, that it's human caused, that it's bad, um, but they don't believe that we're going to do something about it. The indifferent is sort of the mushy middle. It's people who largely endorse that climate change is happening, but they don't show very much concern about it and they don't see personal responsibility. And then uh, the doubtful are um, not sure it's even happening and lowest on the other kinds of questions as well, as you would imagine. Um, oh, I've highlighted Sweden there because this was the last group I gave this talk to, but... Um, you can see this for different countries as well with uh, Great Britain, what is it like ninth in this list or something. Pretty typical proportions for the rest of Europe. If you're thinking about environmental psychology as a potential research area, you might want to use a classic sort of um, attitude scale, either to predict things or as a potential outcome to shift after you manipulate something. We have a new scale that you could consider. It's called the moral environmentalism scale. And we developed it because the previous scales sound to me very left-wing politically. They sound very uh, hippy-dippy. And so we were wondering if we could get a scale that better tracked onto how political conservatives might feel about environment as well. It doesn't just mean answer low on the scale. It means like ask questions about how they would think about what environment means in relation to humans. So a little bit more paying attention to context, I guess. And we did a rash model validation of the scale among other things, but 
what you just look at our scales on the left and then two other classic scales um compared the connectedness to nature scale and the new ecological paradigm but what you see here is on the y-axis is item difficulty so how well does the item discriminate uh, between people of different uh, parts of the distribution from low to high and you see that the other scales only have pretty much easy items so they don't discriminate very well between people who are medium high and high on on this for example we have more difficult to endorse items ah, you can see we also lack some of the more easy items but it's just to show that it's not exactly the same concept space that has been mapped before another angle on um should i have included the let's see here just throw that in the chat for you as well okay Another of the major tools in this area is a, a scale of pro-environmental behavior. I have one, Florian Kaiser, the GEB, that's probably the most famous one. But this one I, I kept using, not just because it was mine, but also because I wanted to have sort of a consistent view about what the other variables, uh, how they relate to it, other variables which change over time as the research changes, of course. This includes a bunch of different behaviors, transportation, alternative transportation, uh, eating less meat, um, uh, talking with friends and family about environmental issues. So it doesn't actually make a ton of sense in psychological terms that all of these behaviors track onto some latent variable called pro-environmental behavior. But you can take a scale like this, and if you measure it something like we did, never to always, it does have decent psychometric properties. What that means, uh, it depends on your perspective, I guess. If you're very behaviorist, it's a little bit incoherent. Um, if you think about it as a sort of classic social science, social psychologist, then you assume that it's tapping into something and you just um, something internal to people. I have come to a kind of a compromise position where I think that I think that these behavior scales that are actually about the past are mostly most similar to a kind of intentions an aspirational behavior that people report they're not actually a good measure of impact so it's more similar to the attitude scale that i showed you then to a measure of how many liters of water they used last month and that's fine it depends on the research question which kind of measure you want to use but it, it was disturbing to realize that self-reported pro-environmental behavior like in the scale i just showed you only explains 21% of the variance in objectively observed behavior. So for example, if you take classic scales like that one, and then you compare them to actually um, being able to watch someone do something or weigh their recycling at the curb or um, get the energy utility to report how much energy they're using, like an actual objective measure. Now they have error as well. Um, but I expected them to relate more. 21% is the is the scatter plot that I've showed you up top. And you can see that, okay, there's definitely a linear relationship there, but it's, it's also pretty messy. Graphing it another way, it's the middle space between these two. And so we have begun to ask in my group, what is all this stuff in self-reported pro-environmental behavior that isn't the overlap with objective behavior? We do that in three ways. The first one is to measure the bias and error in these measures. So one of one of my students, uh, Katharina, looked at this um, question, do, do typical predictors bias the reports of behavior? So what she did is took several common things that happen in, uh, in environmental psychology studies and introduced them to participants as a kind of a prime right before they reported their behavior over the last month. And it's just a question like, would these things affect people's self-reported behavior? For example, one of them was this uh, environmentalist scale. This a predictor, more than anything else, more than attitudes, more than political orientation, best correlates across all my studies with behavior. This is like the monster predictor whether people want us want to be seen as and want to see themselves as an environmentalist so does it affect it and reported behavior is not very affected okay there's one uh, significant difference there but it's quite a small effect 
So I would say, okay, that's not, uh, maybe that's not explaining where uh, these differences are coming out. So then we thought, okay, what is another explanation? Maybe it's social desirability. Maybe people don't want to report accurately or in this context or for whatever reason. So we use the unmatched count technique, which is a, it's a, it's a kind of complicated and um, power hungry technique. You need a lot of participants to do this, but what it does is it, it asks some people a question in the traditional way, just like click yes or no, or a Likert style or whatever. Um, and then some people it embeds it within this covert measure here. So the critical item here is from something called the littering, what is it, littering prevention scale. And so this item is, I usually encourage friends and family to pick up their litter. Do you do that or not? And so some people would answer that in the, in the normal questionnaire, and some people would get it embedded in this list of things, and they only have to reply how many of these statements apply to them. So they might answer, for example, three, but they don't have to say which ones. Then you can also show this set to other people, but without that critical item, and through the magic of mathematics, decide uh, and on some estimate about how many people are endorsing that even covert item. Now, this, this is a bit complicated to administer, and it does require more people. And because you are doing this covert versus not covert comparison between subjects, you can't do an individual um, measures kind of approach with this data. So those are a lot of limitations, but we saw a massive effect for the frequency of uh, people saying that they were doing these litter, littering prevention behaviors, which we selected because they're universally thought of as good, but uh, like don't think that everyone is doing them. I don't know whether it's whether which I don't know which one of these estimates is inaccurate, but I'm just going to guess speculatively that the standard estimate is an overestimate and that this is some sort of social desirability effect. That's interesting because there's literature on social desirability about pro environmental behavior, but it's all from the perspective of find out which people uh, individual differences wise are most concerned about status or uh, displaying and then see if those people report more. That hasn't really panned out, but um, it seems like maybe this other angle is revealing some potential social desirability. Solution number two I want to suggest is uh, to use observed behavior. So to uh, complement the self-reported scales with actually what people are doing. Christian, um, who I mentioned earlier, has a comment out which uh, stirred some controversy in the field, uh, I think usefully, and he suggested that the stage one um, priority when designing a research program should be to identify behaviors with high impact, which means if you're interested in climate change, don't pick recycling because even if we all went to 100% recycling tomorrow, it's not going to it's not going to mitigate climate change. So pick behaviors with high impact. First, map the context and actors who's doing the behavior and where. Don't immediately assume that there's a universal function there. And then evaluate non psychological determinants. And this means like don't just include SES as a covariate. Think about SES as a potential more important cause than all of the psychology predictors. I think this is why it pissed some people off in the field is because um, the traditional way to do this work would be to take something like the theory of planned behavior and think, okay, do I want to measure attitudes or norms or what do I, and then should I include like, okay, let me test this pathway in this population for this behavior. It's very on its head to say, no, no, no. First think of a behavior with high impact whether or not it's easily measured, then who is doing that behavior and what's causing it. So I think it's a little bit more impact focused. I mean, it depends on whether you'd like the research program to be like uh, advancing your subfield or engaging with social, uh, sustainability development goals and, um, and outside groups. He has another paper. Um, we have another paper, which has uh, just been accepted at Nature Sustainability about what predicts green clothing choices. And we included a whole range of psychological predictors I'll tell you about in a second. 
But the outcomes were an environmental apparel scale, which is sort of a classic uh, social psych outcome. And one of the items is uh, buys clothing made from um, organically grown natural fibers. So this is a kind of like a, yeah, we can think of it as a kind of an aspirational behavior, like I was saying earlier. Like I like to think of myself as an eco groovy consumer. But we also measured, and this is the unusual bit, the greenhouse gas emissions from their purchasing and washing clothing behaviors around uh, jeans and t-shirts. And this is, this is rare. We did a um, life cycle assessment, which is a technique from ecology and environmental sciences to, to get to an actual figure of like grams of CO2 equivalent released. These are all the psych predictors we included. You don't need to know what they are, but just like attitudes, norms, goals, self-efficacy, all the stuff that you would expect to see in these kinds of studies. The first result is that the psychological predictors, shown here as dots, by the way, the, the, the scales are dots, so like norms is one of these dots, do predict the environmental apparel scale. Like the kinds of um, psych predictors are related to this kind of mm, intentions to do green. But they, the psych predictors do not predict or predict only a tiny bit the, um, the actual impact variables. Feel free to um, pause me and uh, ask any questions if you want. This one is a little bit counterintuitive. But wait, there's more. It gets worse because people who are high in the environmental apparel scale are actually higher in greenhouse gas emissions. So this is backwards from what you would expect. You would expect the people that are sort of concerned with being eco-groovy would, be, um, would be lower um, in, in impact, but they're higher. And part of the reason is that people who are higher income and higher education also have more impact. Like they live in bigger houses, they buy more clothes, they travel more. And those are the people that are well-educated enough to realize there's a problem with climate change and we should do something about it. And I should signal my green um, behaviors to others. So what I'm seeing here is that, you know, the energy mix of the country matters. That's why Poland is uh, much higher than Sweden, for example. Um, and, uh, and the demographics like income matter and the psychological variables are not important for impact, for clothing, at least in this study. Um, <clears throat> Florian Lange is one of the best researchers in this area. I am super fond of his work. Uh, I couldn't recommend it more highly. And we did a project together a few years ago uh, with a paradigm he developed, and I wanted to mention it as an example of how you get beyond self-report. He developed this in-lab paradigm called the pro-environmental behavior task. And the cover story is that you're taking trips by either bike or by car. And if you choose the car, and you'll make 20 of these decisions or something. If you choose the car, then you uh, get to go out of the experiment faster. Everyone wants to leave the experiment and go back to their lives and get paid, whatever. And so every participant has an incentive to choose the car. But if you do choose the car and you're told this in advance, then lights are turned on and you're told how much pollution those lights are emitting. And in fact, the lights actually are turned on in the lab. And he has a newer paradigm that's cleaner than this and easier. But if you choose the bike, then uh, you have to wait a little bit longer but no lights are turned on and no CO2 is being produced or no extra CO2. As expected, bike choice is heavily affected by the waiting time and by the number of lights, meaning they're sensitive to the paradigm. And I think this, is, um, this shows that this is a much better measure than something like, did they just recycle the debriefing form while you secretly film them as they were walking out of the lab? Like in that data, you would get one or zero. But here you can make people make repeated decisions with different levels of difficulty. You can really get a much um, more reliable uh, estimate of someone's uh, placement of willingness to pollute. And environmentalist identity does correlate with the bike choice um, reasonably strongly as well suggesting that people saw this as an environmentally meaningful choice. 
There are now a number of other paradigms like this. Sebastian Berger at uh, Barron has one, and we could talk more about that if you want. The third solution I wanna to mention to you is that we can use more descriptive models. And, uh, and Matt and I were talking about this right before the talk. And I, I think that uh, like, uh, yeah, Anna, Anna Schiel at, uh, where, is, where was she? Somewhere in the Netherlands, um, did this paper, uh, hypothesis testers should uh, spend less time testing hypotheses. And uh, I have slowly become convinced that she's right. We should probably spend more time on descriptive work. We did, we tried to push this a little bit in a special issue we did for sustainability a few years ago. Put that in the chat too. I'm proud of the special issue. I think they're a good set of papers. We, um, we had to argue with the journal a lot to have edit, a sufficient editorial control over what reviewers were being invited and which reviews were being approved. I would say their standard practices are probably not, not good enough. I don't wanna work there anymore. I don't wanna submit there and I wouldn't edit it again there. But that this special issue, I think, was pretty good. We and we uh, welcomed null findings um, and got some interesting field studies. You know, very effortful work that it helps inform other work, but maybe didn't have those beautiful PNAS style results, believable or not, as uh, as PNAS may be. Another way that we're moving the descriptive work is to think about network models. This. It may look unfamiliar. I don't know how many of you, if anyone works on this kind of thing, but it's not actually that different than just a table of correlations. These, uh, these, what you're looking at can represent partial correlation. So accounting for some of the other variables and the thickness of the lines is, uh, you know, the size of the relationship. And then if it's blue, it's positive. And if it's red, it's negative. What this does is it helps us look at a set of how a bunch of um, questions relate to each other. It could be predictors, outcomes, whatever, but it doesn't bake in your causal assumption. It doesn't assume that there's one causal direction like in a mediation model and that you've nailed it. Instead, it leaves space for us to think about confounders and uh, reverse causal directions and things. So I like it because it just is a nice visual way to look at these for example, up in the upper left, we can see that there's a cluster of uh, negative emotions kinds of terms, and that some of those are more linked to other types of variables and some not. And if you're looking at a table with values, I think it's harder to piece out that kind of thing. So just one option for visualizing your data. These are in, in, easier than ever to do in R. Cameron, can I ask on that plot? Yeah. So what are you actually showing here? What are being correlated um, with respect to these kind of descriptors, water pollution causes waste, air pollution, what's being rated? Yeah, I probably, I probably should have said, sorry. This is from one of our PhD students who is working on attitudes and willingness to pay for bio-based plastics. So basically suggesting to consumers, there's some new plastics, they're better for the environment. Um, you know, what do you think about all these things? And so you, you can ask people about their in current emotional state in a kind of a panis uh, measure, or you could ask people about whether they believe that certain things are important, like convenience, or you could ask people about whether they're concerned about waste. So all kinds of different constructs being measured here, but with, without uh, assuming a strong causal model. Well, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about risk communication because, um, yeah, because the organizers let me know that uh, we wanted to think about, yeah, outreach and application and um, engaged science and community engaged science. And this is part of what I have been doing is taking our, our um, yeah, our communication work with the, with the public. It's very common to think about changing beliefs or changing behaviors with communication. That isn't the only goal you might have, but we'll return to that. Let's think about persuasion. So changing, changing beliefs and, uh, and behavior change. We did a project in collaboration with a water district in California. This um, partially because of the water district being difficult to work with and partially because field studies are just hard anyway took so long to publish. I think this was six years from start to finish. So 
you know, this work is like massively more difficult than the average paper, but when you can get the actual behavior, you know, the water district gave us access to how many liters of water is being used by a household. That's, that seemed to us a very special opportunity compared to um, asking them how many, uh, how much, how, how long the showers were that they were taking. California has been in exceptional drought for many years. I don't know if you knew that, but it continues, unfortunately. Drought is really bad, which means that in this context, we're already intervening where they have, where they have done the reductions that were easy. They had already reduced households, you know, 20 or 30 percent. So this is a tough context to swing in and suggest uh, they should make further voluntary changes. Water managers, the local politicians and engineers and business people who um, actually control the water supply and its price, don't have a lot of options. Like they can change the price, but it's very unpopular. And these are elected in California. So if they were to raise the price a bunch, they just immediately get voted out. So what can they do? Well, we think they can probably message more effectively. And we try and give them toolboxes to do that. In this work, we especially based the interventions on this information, motivation, behavioral skills model. You can think of this as similar to Susan Mitchie's Calm B model. I don't know if uh, you've run into that, but um, broadly, you know, they need to know that there's a problem, kind of a very cognitive level. They need to be motivated. And then they need, even with those, they need uh, to know what to do about it, specifically how to reduce water usage. We have a systematic review, which uses this as the framework to look at a bunch of, I don't know, a few dozen um, interventions. Um, and the review suggests that combining all the interventions is most effective. So that's what we did in this study as well. We had different conditions, but one of them combined all of the different components here. And you can see it's uh, Lake Kachuma that was redacted for a presentation. Lake Kachuma is below 33%, 72% of Goleta residents have found at least two ways to save water, whatever. We're including the different components here. We mailed that physically to addresses uh, in Goleta, California. Water use was heavily skewed, which you would expect because it can't be below zero. And we tried to exclude households that weren't using any water, um, you know, because they're empty or like that wouldn't make sense. So. We tried to find households uh, that were residential, you know, not industrial, not farms, et cetera. And uh, they were using, yeah, 17,000 liters a month. HCF is, uh, is cubic feet. So that's just a bit, that's what water districts use, but it's a bit hard to read. This is the result of the four conditions in the study. Red is control, and then the other colors are all the other conditions. And broadly, any of the conditions worked, and they reduced water use across about two months. And this is in uh, 10,000 households. Wasn't actually that expensive because we only had to pay for the mailing. You may notice we never asked the people anything. We never mailed them a questionnaire. We didn't have to deal with attrition or any of the rest of that. And we don't even know if they opened our mailing, although it appears that they did and that we saw something. All treatments were effective. The combined treatment uh, reduced water use about 2,000 liters per household in the first month and at a very low cost, you know, one mailing. When the districts are already doing these mailings, so it's just to help them be more effective with them. And it was most effective at households with higher use. So that for us was a really nice experience of doing a field study, talking to an outside group. I had no experience of that beforehand. Certainly some lessons learned. So that's a classic kind of behavior change approach, but I wanna talk about the one on the far left here for a second, just sharing information such that it's understood. I think that this is really neglected in, in social psychology. I, I can't speak to other areas, but there's not that much work where you'll see the DV comprehension. Mostly the DV is like decisions or, um, yeah, beliefs or something like that. But just did they even understand it? To provide these kinds of evidence summaries, you need to learn what to consider, like what do these people need to know and identify the most important uh, effects. Then you need to do uh, 
you need to do the sort of Cochrane review or a systematic review to gather that evidence or have someone else do that and borrow it and then communicate the evidence such that it's understood. In the UK, when I was working with different groups on this, I would say steps one and two, pretty well, uh, pretty well covered. And the Green Book and other kinds of government manuals are good advice on those. Step three, less good. Uh, it's not as well understood uh, how to do that. So one of the things we did when I was working at the Winton Center um, in Cambridge was we wrote this paper about how policy options were being communicated. And what is a policy option? It's not like your own decision for medical treatment, for example, but it could be, how do we decide as a group of people what to do about taxes, health, climate change, international trade, Brexit? And then uh, what we did in this is we kind of did three reviews, like how are these policy options currently being communicated in summaries and figures? What guidance exists for communicators, like the government manuals I just mentioned? And are these methods effective? There isn't a lot of guidance. Policy options are being communicated in all kinds of different ways. And uh, we don't really know whether they're effective. That's the short answer. But what we synthesized it down into is to say there's four key problems as the communicator. Different impacts on different people. That's why we called it winners and losers. Multiple outcomes means impacts to health, let's say, and to, uh, and to finances and it's difficult to aggregate across them. Not impossible. You know, the NHS has a uh, quality, um, what is it called? Quality life years adjustment. Like there is a, there's an amount of pounds that a quality life year is worth in a patient, 20,000 pounds or something. I don't remember what it is, um, but it is a challenge. Long time scales are a challenge as, as are large uncertainties. So just, uh, just for a view into that, uh, and we have some other work with the center as well um, about how icons are understood. Like I did a big project with all the what works centers in the UK across a few years. There's one for education, there's a center for crime reduction, and they use all these icons and are the icons understood when they're communicating evidence to, let's say, um, people who run a police station or school governors. Uh, and Ask me about that, or you can find that article on my website if you want. We're getting right to the end of the talk here. Um, yeah, one of, the, one of the things we discussed with organizers was about outreach. Um, I do some consulting. Um, I also have some advice about how to use Twitter or other social media sites for professional purposes, because I found that my, I'll put that in the chat too, I found that my students didn't have a good handle on what Twitter was for. I have found it absolutely supercharger for my enthusiasm for my work and for being connected with lots of cool work that's going on. So many of the papers I mentioned to you today, I have not met those people. Uh, we just became collaborators through Twitter and then started working on things and I was delighted to be involved. Um, it's also just you know worth noting, like here's a 28 day summary where tweets that I wrote have have made 208,000 impressions. Like, I don't get that kind of reach in this context or in my classes or basically anywhere else in life. So if you have something that you want to be shared or questions or you want to discuss, yeah, like this, the audience reach here is potentially incredible. I don't even have that many followers. And the point isn't to have a lot, but I'm happy with these public discussions and it's serving my career very well. To connect further on some of the things we talked about today, there are a bunch of psychology and environment professional societies. In the UK, third on the list there, British Environmental Psychology Society. In particular, the University of uh, Surrey, uh, Guildford is a very strong group in that, but also Plymouth. So yeah, there's, there's cool stuff going on. I'm sure they'd love to talk with you. Scientists for Future um, have, a, have a group in the UK. There's the link for Sweden. I forgot to take it out, sorry. And I would also recommend uh, ICEP and the APA Division 34, which is um, one of the biggest international groups of interested in environmental psychology, broadly speaking. These are loose groups of people who work on really different stuff. So um, don't, 
be intimidated that it's all one thing or that they you wouldn't connect with whatever you're interested in. And I mentioned earlier, there's sort of meso organizational levels that can be some of the most effective, like you're running a, you're running a department talk series and they serve sandwiches. What kind of sandwiches can you, can you uh, change how travel and virtual talks are run? Or we recently in the Netherlands achieved uh, getting our pension fund to divest from fossil fuels, ABP, which is a, a fund with, I don't know, 15, 17 uh, billion euros. So yeah, that's probably more important than my home recycling. And we were delighted to do it. Um, thank you very much to all of my collaborators and students. And uh, I increasingly just watch them do research and, and join in. And, uh, and I'd be happy to take your questions. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cameron. Um, and you should see the the digital applause upon your screen now. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm happy to to you know open the floor to questions if folks want to raise their hands um, or put some questions in the chat. Dave, go ahead. Sure. So uh, I was really interested in you know trying.